Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about supernova. More specifically though, supernova that may have influenced the atmosphere of our own planet in the last 40,000 years or so, because the recent paper that was just released not so long ago suggests that there are definitive signs of at least four major supernova influencing the Earth's atmosphere that can be detected inside the tree rings of ancient trees. In other words, let's talk about what happens when a supernova explodes somewhere in the Milky Way and has a bit of an influence on our own planet. Although just a clear clarification, we're not talking about supernova very close to planet Earth. Something that would potentially cause a complete destruction of the planet or something that would cause an extinction event. Such as the one you're about to see here in a few seconds. Here we're talking about supernova that are still thousands or at least a few hundred light years away from planet Earth far enough where only minute effects from these events would be observed somewhere on the planet. And in this case, these effects would not actually even be that dangerous, because apparently no major extinction events or no major events of any kind were associated with any of these supernova. So here we're not talking about anything super dangerous. And there goes our planet Earth. It just disappeared because I created a hypothetical scenario where our sun goes supernova. Not going to happen, but still interesting to simulate. But first of all, how do we know any of this and how do we actually measure all of these effects? All of this is related to a very well known effect known as radiocarbon dating. It sort of works as follows. Today we know that the cosmic um, rays, cosmic radiation comes from every direction and strikes our planet's atmosphere. And when these cosmic rays strike certain atoms, they actually convert these atoms into something else. In this case, when either the cosmic rays from outer space or from our own sun hit the atoms of nitrogen-14, or essentially nitrogen that's uh, the most prevalent element in our atmosphere, they convert this into a radioactive isotope of carbon known as carbon-14. This isotope is not stable and will actually convert back into nitrogen after some time, with the half-life being roughly around uh, 5700 years or approximately 5500 years. And because of this, we can actually use the mathematical prediction model to try to estimate the age of a certain object based on the amount of radioactive emissions coming from carbon-14 in, for example, um, a tree or, let's just say, some sort of an old artifact discovered in a cave somewhere that was created by one of our ancestors. I'm actually posting the link for this really interesting uh, simulation slash radioactive dating game that kind of shows you how all of this works and you can also try all of this by yourself by using this dating game here and by then trying to estimate the age of these different artifacts when you're already given the amount of carbon-14 present in a certain object. Like for example here, we can see that because there's about 88% of carbon-14 on the inside, it's most likely around 1000 and I would say, uh, yeah, I guess just 1000. It's approximately 1000 years old. So here we can check the estimate and it's going to tell us that we are correct. This was created by the team from Colorado University a few years ago and it's actually a really good way of learning about carbon dating and about how we usually determine the age of various objects. But all of this is based on the assumption that the radiation or the cosmic rays coming from all over the place are more or less constant throughout the, let's just say, period of 100,000 years. The thing is, we know that our sun changes in terms of flare activity, for example. It also gets to be a little bit more active once in a while. We also know that other different cosmic events can influence the amount of cosmic rays coming toward our planet. And big events like supernova can definitely change all of these measurements as well. As a matter of fact, today we know that we are most likely moving through an ancient supernova right now, because certain observations do suggest that there is a slight increase in the radioactivity coming from various regions um, in our atmosphere. Today we refer to this as the local cloud. And so as a result, this is sort of what solar activity events and essentially carbon-14 measurements look like from the past uh, thousand or so years. For the most part here, we assume that most of these uh, increases in carbon-14 were actually most likely caused by higher activity from the sun and not necessarily from supernova or other events. Here's another interesting graph that shows you a correlation between the number of sunspots observed and the overall level of carbon-14 recorded in various trees, specifically tree rings, as those trees were absorbing the CO2 uh, containing carbon-14 and allowed us to calculate how much of certain emissions were coming from the sun. 
But very recently, this particular study that you can also find in the description below argued that there were at least four major events that were not solar, they were not sun-related. In other words, four events that happened in the last 40,000 years may have actually been caused by something a lot more energetic, a distant supernova in this case. And specifically in this paper, the scientists were able to identify four unique events that most likely were supernova that happened in the last 15,000 years. And the way that this was done was pretty clever. By looking at the known nebula out there, such as four nebula that we know were caused by supernova approximately a few thousand years ago, and by then, by looking at various rings in ancient trees and looking at the spikes in those rings, four very specific events were identified in those rings with major spikes of carbon-14 that then subsided over the next few years, suggesting that this was probably a supernova, because that's usually how long the supernova lasts. For example, today we know that the Vela Pulsar that you see right there, that's extremely bright and very well known today, is located inside what's known as a Vela supernova remnant that most likely occurred about 12,300 years ago. And this was at a distance of about 800 light years away from planet Earth when it happened, and actually corresponded to an increase of about 3% of carbon-14 during that particular period. In other words, the radiation coming from this region increased by about 3%. So definitely not enough to cause an extinction event, but enough to raise the levels of radiation to possibly have some effect on some life on the planet. In this case, maybe increasing the chances for mutations slightly, and thus increasing the speed of evolution. Another supernova remnant that doesn't have a cool name happened around 7,700 years ago and was actually much farther away, about 2,300 light years away from us. And here the carbon spike was at least 2%. In other words, the supernova may have been actually more powerful or at least had just as much effect on planet Earth as a much closer Vela supernova. Another event known as G266, also known as Vela Jr., happened about 2,800 years ago and most likely increased the total carbon-14 by about 1.5%. And interestingly, this is actually something that some of the ancient humans should have seen. But there hasn't really been a lot of reports about this particular supernova, which means that maybe it was one of the unique supernova, such as, for example, the gorgeous and invisible Cassiopeia A, the secrets of which we recently solved and about which you can learn in one of the previous videos, which is somewhere right there, by the way. And the last definitive supernova here was this one right here that most likely happened around 5400 years ago at a distance of at least a thousand light years away from Earth and most likely increased the total carbon by at least 1%. In other words, these supernova events seem to be quite frequent and they do frequently change the composition of the air on our planet, increasing the carbon-14 levels but most likely not actually having any sort of long-term effects because no extinction event or no major extinction event has been associated with any of these nearby supernova in the last 40,000 or so years. But interestingly, at least 18 different supernova remnants are known in the vicinity within about 5,000 light years away from planet Earth, so it's really surprising that only four of them left these somewhat difficult to see marks. In other words, what all of this suggests is that these distant supernova, even if they are somewhat close to our planet, don't fortunately cause any major problems on the planet. They, as a matter of fact, don't seem to have as much effect whatsoever. There's definitely a way for us to detect their presence, and there's a way for us to maybe even measure their effects, but the effects are extremely minuscule. As a matter of fact, the sunspots and the sun activity seems to be a lot more prominent and have a lot more effect on our planet which obviously shouldn't really come as a surprise. So the supernova are really nothing to worry about, especially the ones we always talk about, like Betelgeuse or any other star that might go supernova in the next few thousands of years. Nevertheless, it's a pretty interesting study and it's a pretty interesting discovery, and if you'd like to learn more, check out the paper in the description below. Also, check out the simulations from the Colorado University to learn a little bit more about carbon dating. On that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the Wonderful Person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.